Honourable men, lovely to see you here tonight and we're looking forward uh, to worshipping God together. Uh, we're looking forward to hearing from our two guest speakers. That makes you feel very special, men, doesn't it? Special guest speakers. And we realise we've made a mistake. We have two English men with us. But one said he's going to put on a Northern Ireland accent, so we're looking forward to hearing that a little bit later on. Phil and Johnny, you're very welcome, and we're so thankful, men, that you've taken the time and prepared to come and talk to us. Uh, Phil is the, the, the principal in Grey Abbey Primary, and Johnny is one of the VPs in Glastry College. The only wee announcement is just to remind you of our evening event with David Graham, Linfield's general manager, Friday the 29th of September in Grey Abbey at 7pm. Tickets are £10, which includes food, and the proceeds are going to Christian Guidelines and the National Autism Society. We do really need to know the numbers, men, so if you... I know a lot of people go, I, I need three of those tickets. Well, you need to tell somebody who's got the tickets that you need three so that we can get the numbers in for catering. Uh, that would be great. Um, really, all we're going to do is what we normally do. For those of you who are new to us, we're, we're going to, I'm going to hand over to Paul. He's going to lead us into worship, pray with us. We're going to sing, uh, and then I'm going to read something, and we'll hand over then to, to our two speakers. We'll get a cup of tea then, and we'll, we'll just offer a couple of three spaces for you to go and have a chat, uh, breaking into maybe three or four groups and we'll, uh, we'll come back then. And if you have any questions for either of the two guys, then we can put them to them. Put them really under pressure. Uh, really deep, deep theological questions, boys. Really, you know, that's what we want here. Uh, or any questions you would have, we'll, we'll, we'll hand them back then. So I'm going to hand over to Paul, and, and Paul will lead us at this point on. Good evening, gentlemen. It's good to see you all for this first men's gathering of the new season. We're going to open God's word together now, so if you open with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and it's verses 4 to 11. First Thessalonians 5, 4 to 11. This is the word of God. But you, brothers, are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all sons of the light and sons of the day, and we do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be alert and self-controlled. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we, we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. Amen. And we thank God for his word. So gentlemen, these, these verses, they remind us that as children of the light and followers of Christ, we are called to be awake and sober in our faith. Our lives, they should reflect the hope of salvation we have received through Jesus Christ. And in a world today often shrouded in darkness, we are beacons of God's love and grace as believers. So Paul, he urges us to encourage one another and build each other up. And this means that we should come alongside each other, supporting and uplifting each other in our journey of faith. So encouragement, it's not just a kind word or a pat on the back, it's a reflection of Christ's love in action. It's walking with one another through joys and trials offering a listening ear, a helping hand, and fervent prayers. So as we gather here this evening, let us be mindful of this call to encourage one another and let our worship be a testament to the hope we have in Christ. And may our fellowship be marked by love, support, and encouragement. So together as one body, may we shine the light of Christ in this world and build each other up in faith. We're going to unite our hearts now and join together in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this evening with hearts full of adoration and thanks, acknowledging your presence in our lives. 
And Lord, as we gather here, we're reminded of the words from 1 Thessalonians, which encourage us to encourage one another and build one another up. So Lord, we seek to do just that as we gather together. And Lord, we adore you for the light you've brought into our lives. You are the source of all wisdom and understanding. And Father, we're grateful for your guidance. Lord, your presence, it fills us with awe, and we praise your name for the love and grace you grant to us each day. You are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, and we worship you with all our hearts. So, Father, we humbly come before you acknowledging our failures. Lord, we confess the times when we've fallen short in encouraging one another. Forgive us for the moments when we allowed our own worries and concerns to overshadow the needs of others. Help us to be more mindful of those around us, to extend a helping hand, and to be a source of encouragement. So gracious God, we thank you for the blessings you give us. We are grateful for the gift of fellowship and community, and for the friends and loved ones who uplift us in times of need. We thank you for the gift of your word, which serves as a constant source of inspiration and encouragement in our lives. Lord, we thank you for Derek and Johnny, who will share their words with us this evening, touching our hearts and being instruments of your grace. So, Lord, as we take part in our time of discussion, we lift these men up to you. We pray that you would anoint their words and allow them to speak directly to our hearts. Grant them wisdom and insight to share messages of encouragement that resonate with each one of us. May their words be a reflection of your divine love, inspiring us to be better, to love deeper, and to encourage one another in our journey of faith. So, Father, we ask for your blessing upon our time of discussion, and may the words spoken here be filled with love, grace, and understanding. And let this men's gathering be a space where we can openly share our thoughts and feelings, knowing that we are among friends and fellow believers. Lord, we pray that our discussions would be fruitful and that we would leave this gathering strengthened in our faith. Lord, we know that life can be filled with challenges and uncertainties, but with you by our side, we find hope and purpose. So help us to be beacons of encouragement to those we encounter in our daily lives. Teach us to be quick to uplift others, slow to judge, and always ready to extend a hand of support. Lord, may our hearts be aligned with your will, and may we go forth from this moment with a renewed sense of purpose to be encouragers in the lives of those around us. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand now and praise God as we sing Everlasting God and Waymaker. Let's stand together and worship God.
got to take you up first. I tell you what I was worried about. There's an awful rattle on that new roof up there, right above the drum kit, but it's all stayed up there now. So, uh, I just wanted to read a couple of verses from uh, Colossians to think about why we've asked these men to come and speak to us. If you want to open your Bibles there, Colossians chapter 3, just very quickly, we'll know the passage really well. And don't just shout out your hallelujahs when I read the first verse. Wives, submit to your husbands. Just, well, your wife's not here, you see, so that's why he's brave. Wives, submit to your husbands. Husbands, love your wives. Do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents. And everything for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, don't embitter your children, for they will become discouraged. So, of course, those are verses about headship. Different sermon, but it sets us up kind of what we're talking about. We are to be men of God. Then it says, slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything that you do. Not only when their eye is on you, but to win their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do. Work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you're serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for his wrong and there is no favoritism. Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and be fair because you know that you also have a master in heaven. We're to obey earthly masters. We're to be good workers times that's easier than others, of course, but the eye of God is always upon us, man. Work at everything as working for the Lord. Whether you're a slave or a master, whether employed or an employer, we are to do right. Then chapter 4, verse 2 says, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. Pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders and make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversations be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. It's these few verses that we're wanting to focus on tonight. Be devoted to prayer. We want to be men who are praying men. We want to be men who are proclaiming Christ, whatever our circumstances We want to be wise about that, making the most of every opportunity in grace-filled conversations. Answering questions, not about the weather or about the rugby or about the football. Answering questions about our faith in Jesus Christ. So we're thankful for Phil and Johnny to come and share their blessings and their challenges and their feelings about being men of faith in the education sector. So, man, thank you very much. Now, Phil, it's your turn. Evening. Um, You know, it's like when you sit there and you've been asked to come and do something and then you think, oh, maybe they want more of a sermon. So this isn't a sermon. This is about my experiences Uh, how I find being uh, a man in education and the challenges that that brings and also being a husband and being a father as well. And Johnny's the more spiritual one. He'll bring the real. (laughs) No pressure. Um, As you can tell, I've really taken on the Northern Irish accent. You can't even tell. You know, I've been here for 30 years. I moved here in 1993 to, and married Sharon, who's from here. I started off teaching in Antrim, um, a small school there. Uh, and then we moved house and started going to Whitehead Baptist uh, Church. And I got a teaching job in Grey Abbey in 1997, 20, oh, almost 27 years ago now. Uh, I had four children. Uh, and then before 2006, we moved down to Kirkcubbin, down this way. Uh, and in 2006, we planted a, a church in Kirkcubbin. It's called Kirkcubbin Community Church. Um, it's a Baptist church, but it doesn't have Baptist in the name for the community around us. Uh, and in 2009, I became principal in Grammy Primary School. So that's now 14 years I've been there as principal. So one of the questions that uh, Neil said to me was, what, what's it like to express faith in primary school? And I might 
strike a chord with many of you. I know there's some people here who, are, who find it really easy to share your faith with people, people uh, round about you. I have some rubbish at sharing my faith uh, with my colleagues. I find it really hard. Okay. I find it much easier to show my faith by the way I speak to them, by the way I value them, uh, by the way I take an interest in their lives and offer a sense of hope. Um, I think one of the things that I've been finding for children, but also just across education with the way things are at the moment, is just a lack of hope. Where is it? Where is it going? What is happening? on the big scale for schools, um, but also on the smaller scale in families for children. The one thing as Christians that we can certainly offer is a sense of hope and direction that seems to have been lost. You have to be careful, especially as a boss of adults, you have to be careful about how you share your faith um, and I found that I have opportunities much more to be much more explicit about my faith through assemblies. When I take assemblies in school, uh, I can share what I believe. But I also always take the opportunity to say to the children that there's other people that they will come into contact with. There's people who will be sitting there who have other beliefs because of what their parents have taught them. I can pound the lectern, okay, yeah, good. So I think it's really important to say to children, you know, you've got to actually think about this. You don't take it because I'm the principal standing at the front. You have to have your thoughts. You have to work out where you are going to put your faith. One of the ways I do that is uh, whenever I pray at the front of school, uh, I would always say to the children, there's a word that you say at the end of a prayer, and they all know it. They all know amen when you get to the end of a prayer. I had one child one time. I'd obviously been going on a bit too long in the prayer, and this little girl in P2 said amen when I hadn't finished. <laughs> so you can do that any time you want. When you think they're going on, you can just say amen. Um, but I always say to the children before I start praying, I say, there's a word you say at the end. What does that word mean? Amen means I agree, we agree. And I say to the children, you've got to listen to my prayer. You must only say to God, amen, if you agree with what I've said. And again, it's giving the children that time to actually think it through, to challenge them to work it out for themselves. One of the challenges over the last couple of years, um, we've had a couple of families who've asked for their children not to be in either RE or assemblies, and this is something that's happening more and more across different schools. I think because we're a small village school, we haven't experienced it as much. Um, my approach has been to get to know the families, trust them, get them to trust me. And one of the things I've seen from that is one of the families now will allow their child to stay in assemblies when I'm taking it, because they trust me, but still if Neil's coming in or someone, another minister's coming in, they, they don't know that person. Um, so sometimes you have to take that slow process of getting people to trust you and getting them to know you. And I think them knowing that I give the children the opportunities to think and don't just try and put it on them is important. Neil also said, well, what about some of the school's issues you've heard round and about? And one of the things you may have heard of The Amazing Journey, I think most people have heard of The Amazing Journey, goes into schools and things and shows children the journey through the Bible. And there's a local primary school up in Bangor, uh, and the humanist parents said to the principal, I want my child to be removed from that, not to go to The Amazing Journey. But the bigger challenge was, they said... I don't want them to go to that, but you have to provide something equally stimulating for my daughter to go to, which is nigh on impossible for one child, you know, something that's up. And those are the sort of things 
there's much more coming in uh, to different um, schools and things. So in terms much more personally for me, the challenges uh, are balancing life. And I know I'm speaking to people who will have those challenges as well. Whatever stage of life you're at, there's the challenges of balancing and keeping your life on track. Now I've got down here uh, five priorities that I've got in my life, okay? Um, and don't tell Neil, he can not listen because the lowest one is being a school principal in these five, okay? He's on my board of governors, so he'll report it back. So the first principle, I think, is, the first priority, sorry, is being a Christian. Loving God first. Loving God the most. If we get him first, then the others start to fall into place after that. My second priority is as a husband. I remember someone telling us once, um, just before we had our first child, make sure you don't love your children more than your wife. Make sure you keep that relationship special. Not because that's not good for the child. That's the best thing for a child to have, to grow up with that relationship, knowing that they aren't the most important. And actually, I see that in school with children, where children are elevated to almost, like, almost for the family, like a godlike status, where the child can't do any wrong, where the child thinks that they are the most important thing more than thinks, knows that they are the most important thing. So if you're a young person, you haven't had your family yet, I say, I say make sure your love for your wife is so much more important. But third, being a father. I have four children. Uh, they're all grown up now, they're all in their 20s. And life is tough when they're young. It's busy. It's hard to get out to church. It's hard to do all the things that you need to do. But as a father, you are the first witness to your children of what a heavenly God is like. You're the first person who shows them what love is. You're the first person who shows them what discipline is, good discipline. You're the first person who shows them what faithfulness is. And for that to be a really good demonstration, that starts with your love for God, then your love for your partner. Later on, just two years ago, two and a half years ago, uh, we'd thought about it a long time ago about becoming foster carers. Uh, and we've also started doing respite foster care once a month for a weekend. And that's brought another different dimension, going from having children who are 20s to having a little girl who's six or seven. Um, and it reminds me how I don't have as much energy as I used to have. Um, but there are opportunities like that as well. A fourth in the priorities in my life would be in church. And some people might be like, well, what, why is that so low down? If I don't get those other relationships right, then I'm not going to be a good elder. I'm an elder in my church. We actually, my wife and I moved down here to plant the church in Kirkcubbin. But if you don't get those other priorities right, then at some point you're going to implode. And then fifth, as I said, would be being a principal in a local school. That doesn't mean it's not important to me. That should show you how important the other things are to me. I've committed 27 years of my life to Grey Abbey Primary School. I believe that I'm not there because I thought it was a good idea. I'm there because God thought it was a good idea. God knew that I needed the school. The school needed me, but it also tied in with the other things. And as you go through life, you will look back on life and you will see how God brings things 
together for you. So actually, I don't mind that the governors know that. I think they need to know that if you have the other priorities in place, then you will be the person who can keep going in the hard times. And believe me, at the moment, schools are going through really hard times and challenges with finance, challenges with authority, challenges with social breakdown and all the issues that come with that. It needs strong people to be in schools for the sake of our children, to take care of them. So it's a busy life, and I know you all have busy lives. There's not one person who you talk to and they say, oh no, it's easy going. Yeah, I can lay back and just sit and watch the rugby all the time. Most of us are watching the rugby for a, a release, a chance to get away from all the busyness of life. So how do you keep God first? Well, I was really, I was a bit worried when I was listening first of all, I thought, oh, I haven't prepared what they want to hear. But then I heard the verses that you read there, Paul, uh, and just thought the bit that you read from First Thessalonians, therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just in fact, as in fact you are doing. And I wrote down earlier, just to finish off, was that if I get all these other things right, it will benefit me, but also others. But life is tough. At times, life can be rubbish. Again, there's not going to be anyone here who wouldn't agree to that, that things hit you that just floor you. So as men, we need to know that we need other men. And it's great that you've got this, to get come together to talk and things like that. And we know women tend to find it easier. We tend to just talk about the rugby or the weather or anything but ourselves. And to cultivate friendships, we actually have to do something about that. Those of you that are farmers know that to cultivate a field, you have to plough it up. You have to bear the fresh earth. Do you have friends who you can send a text to and say, look, I need you to pray for me? Do you have someone that when you meet them at church, you can take them aside at the end and say, look, I need to talk to someone. I need to tell you about this. As men, we will want to give the answer. We will want to fix them. Yes? Most times, nearly all times, you can't fix someone when they tell you their problems. But you can be the person who cares for them and listens to them and prays for them. So have you cultivated relationships like that? Obviously you are part way along the line because you're thinking about this and coming to this, but to actually do that, you have to bear the earth of your life. And as men, we don't like that. We don't like to be vulnerable. We don't like to share our problems and our issues and difficulties. And I'm not saying to do that up the front here to everyone, but have you got a friend that you can go out for coffee with? We all need that. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as, in fact, you are doing. Is that okay if I pray for the men? Is that okay? Jesus, it's so good to know that you were a man and you knew, you know exactly what it's like, how tough it can be. Thank you that you didn't try and do it on your own. You gathered people around you that you shared with. Help us not to try and do it on our own. Help us tonight to, to share a bit, even if it's not in the small groups. Uh, maybe it'll be doing the coffee with someone to so just go a bit deeper. If someone says, how are you? To actually tell them a bit. And help us to be committed to each other. Help us to, to pray for each other and be willing to ask for prayer as well. 
you know how tough it is to get the priorities of life right. Help us this week to love you, God, first and most. And we pray that as we do that, we will see all those other priorities falling into place so that we can be yours, so that we can be people who encourage others, but also offer hope in a hopeless world. Thank you, Father. Amen. That was great, Phil. Thank you so much. We're going to stand together. We're going to sing a piece. And uh, these are the days of Elijah. And uh, then uh, when that finishes, Johnny, you just come on ahead.
Goodness me. Um, some serious wisdom in Phil's words there. Um, I'm glad Neil gave you some, um, some guidance, Phil, because all he said to me was just uh, speak from the heart, brother. Um, so, so I don't know if, he, if he's setting me up here or, uh, or whether this is going to be uh, relevant to you or not. But um, good evening, everybody. It's great to be here. Uh, there are a few sort of faces I recognize, um, former students that I've taught, I think, um, and a few parents of, of, of students that I've taught. But it is great to be here. So thanks very much for inviting me, Neil. Um, I'm used to speaking in front of students um, and, and class in assemblies and stuff like that. Um, but I must admit, when I'm speaking in front of adults, I do genuinely get quite nervous. And so I have to do sort of staff training and things like that. I'm speaking in front of, of my peers. And there was one time a few years ago where I was, I was a wee bit nervous and I was wearing a pale blue shirt. And you know inevitably what's going to happen. So I thought, I know what I'll do. I'll run up to my confiscation drawer. I've got a wee drawer that I confiscate stuff off the students and things. Because I know there's a load of antiperspirant in there. But what I forgot when I got into my room is that I had a bad back for a couple of weeks and uh, I reached out and sprayed under my arm some deep heat. Absolute nightmare. <laughs> so uh, so uh, no, such mis no such mishaps today though, um, though yet. So um, for those of you that don't know then, I, I grew up on a farm in Oxfordshire, so I'm a farmer's son and I got a geography degree um, from Derby and then a PGCE from, from Nottingham. And then I, walked, I worked for four years in a place called Wootton Bassett um, that was where they used to repatriate the soldiers um, from Iraq and Afghanistan. And while I was there, I met a girl from Northern Ireland, as you do. And um, she told me, you know, uh, do you know what? Northern Ireland, don't, don't want to go back there. It's a wee parochial place. Don't want to go back too small. Everybody knows who you are. And I was like, oh, fair enough. That's okay. That's okay. We want to stay in England. We were living in Bath. It was beautiful at the time. We ended up getting married. Within six months of being married, where was I? Buying a house in Belfast, of course. Um, so uh, I taught in England, like I say, for four years, and then moved to, to Northern Ireland. And when I moved here, I was told um, at the time, it was back in the early noughties, you ne you'll never get a job here. Um, certainly not a permanent job. And so obviously, I had people praying for, for myself and praying for Catherine and so on and so forth. And uh, I actually got the first job I applied for, and it was down at Glastry College. And that was 17 years ago. Um, and I firmly believe that that was obviously a God appointment, and God was obviously at work there. Um, but I do remember the first uh, time I came into the school. Uh, I knew it was a school for me. This was for my interview. There was a tractor parked in the car park. Um, and even better than that, on my first day, I used to teach out, out in one of the mobiles, and there was a dairy herd walking past the, past the classroom. So I knew, yep, I'm a farmer's son. This is the place for me. Um, so in Matthew chapter 5, the, uh, verse 13, uh, Jesus talks about Christians being salt and light um, in the world. And in John 15, he talks about the image of the vine and how as Christians we need to be connected to that vine, and he's obviously that vine. And I believe that when we establish really strong roots in Jesus, um, fruit is going to grow from that place. Um, I think it's really important to say as well that in England, it's a very, very different place to Northern Ireland when it comes to uh, a Christian context, a very different place. The school I worked in uh, was about 17, 1,800 students. There were about 130 teaching staff, probably 60 or 70 um, other non-teaching staff. And there were two Christians, myself and my wife. That's a very, very different place to Northern Ireland. Um, and at the time, uh, Catherine was trying to set up a, a scripture union, a Christian union there. And um, she wanted to give it a name. She didn't want to call it a Christian union because that comes with all sorts of connotations in England and stuff like that that we didn't want to be negative. And the church we were going to at the time believed in um, words, pictures, and stuff like that being sort of called out at a particular point in the service, and people would pray for that. And we'd been praying for a name and just couldn't come up with one. And one time, somebody called out X Club. X Club. And I believe that's still the name of the club in that school today. So, you know, I believe in a God that speaks to us a living God that speaks to us and speaks into our lives. Um, I do know as well that, that when we left, um, I worked there for four or five years, like I said, um, and, and we went back um, after about a year and we met up with one of my mates in that in the particular faculty and my wife was an RE teacher, I was a geography teacher. And um, he said, oh, it's just so different since you've left. So different since you've left. I mean, like, what, what do you mean? He said, well, the atmosphere. The atmosphere is much different since you two have left. There's, there's a different vibe. It's less calm. There's more arguments amongst the staff. There's more arguments amongst the, the, between the staff and the students and stuff. And that's purely because, you know, we were living from that vine. Myself and Catherine, we were connected into that. And we're called to be salt and light in our workplaces. And that's not just in an education environment. That's in every work environment. We're called for, you know, to be connected into Jesus. And when we're connected into him, their fruit will grow. So that was just, um, I guess, one of the sort of most significant things from, 
from my time in England. And, and I'm most, I suppose it's quite significant as well. I didn't become a Christian until I was like 22, 23. Um, and so a lot was happening in my life at that time. And just to hear that from somebody who I'd sort of started to work with, you know, it's just so powerful that actually we, we, we do so much for our example, just as you said, Phil, it's just so much from our example that's so important. If you're not that good at sharing your faith, live by, um, by his example. Um, I recently did an assembly um, talking to students about getting ready for, for learning. Um, and I don't know about children's talks in your church, but sometimes there's a, there's a tenuous link between the idea, the hook that you're trying to get students to, to listen to, and then what you're, you're actually trying to um, talk about. And one of the, the hooks I was talking about a few weeks ago was about cities in ancient civilizations. And cities in ancient civilizations had, had walls, um, and there was a really simple reason for that. Because outside of the city walls, it was a barbarous place. It was a dangerous place. And basically, if you were trying to set up a life for yourself outside of the city walls, people would just come along and say, actually, do you know what? I quite fancy what you've got and just take it. And that might be your property, your livestock, your family, your children, your whatever. It's a really quite dangerous place. Whereas inside the city walls, because you've got those walls, it's a safe place. It's a safe place. And, uh, and what, what tended to happen then is that the rule of law would be set up um, and people were able to trade with each other. Um, and then people started to sort of like become artisans. Children started to be educated. What happened inside the walls of the city is people started to flourish, started to become the people that they were meant to be. Um, and there are lots of references to city walls in the Bible, as you know. And this is one that I just came across, which, which I think is great and kind of sums it up. It's in 2 Chronicles chapter 14, verse 7. Um, and it's about King Asa. He said to Judah, let's build cities and give them walls and towers and gates and bars. The land is before us because we have sought Jehovah our God. We have sought him and he has given us rest on every side. So they built and they prospered. Schools are a little bit like this with rules for behavior, um, for learning, for moving around the corridors, for lots of different things. But they're designed primarily to keep students safe, um, but also to ensure that they learn. Um, but we need our walls in schools to be built of more than this. And, and it was a few years ago... Uh, an email came through to the senior leadership team, and um, it was basically from a group in uh, Trinity in Grey Abbey who had been actually praying for the college in general, and I just thought this was absolutely incredible. It was so reassuring to know that um, prayer was happening outside of the school for the teachers in the school, for the school itself, for the students, um, because prayer is going to help to build those city walls in a way that you can't just do in a secular way. It's more than just rules sometimes. Um, and I suppose the really good thing in that, like I said about Wharton Bassett, two out of 130 staff, two out of 200 staff were Christians. In Glastry College, it's over a third. It's over a third. And there are teachers that meet and pray for the school and pray for the students. Um, and that's primarily so that it's a place, building a place where children can flourish and be who they were made to be. And I suppose the message I would be as a, as a, as a dad is if you're a parent of a, of a child in school, pray for your children's school. Pray for the teachers. Um, pray for the, for the other children in the school, just that God's kingdom would be built there. It's so powerful, and we underestimate the power of prayer. And I know, Neil, you mentioned that, that, that we would be men of prayer. And it's, it's a fascinating thing. I don't know if it's different in the, in the city to the country. I live in Belfast. Um, but men find it so much more difficult to pray, particularly in small groups. I don't know why. Um, but we shouldn't be. We shouldn't be scared of praying for things that we value. And we value our children. We value education. So... A few years ago, um, I'm going to talk a bit about ideology now in education. I hope you don't mind. Um, it's a bit of a, um, a favorite of mine. But I went through a little bit of a paradigm shift in the way I view education and my sort of theoretical perspective on um, how, how education should work and specifically how children learn. And I guess from my experience in England in the early sort of noughties, um, I sort of experienced a, what would be considered a progressive view of education. Um, sort of a slightly left of centre, left-leaning sort of way of looking at it. Um, and it was about, really about what we call discovery learning. So students, like, building knowledge for themselves and stuff like that. And that's great, and it does work in certain contexts. And then I came across a brilliant book by uh, a lady called Daisy Christodoulou um, called Seven Myths About Education. It completely changed my view. Um, and what it did is it consolidated a kind of more traditional view of education, if, that's, if, if you like, um, based on direct instruction. I um, mean, it's not saying that discovery learning isn't good, okay, about children's, you know, kind of learning um, knowledge for themselves, but it just says there's something else that has to come first. 
Um, and I suppose the irony is that um, a lot of the discovery learning that, that is coming from left of centre, left leaning sort of organisations and stuff like that is meant to sort of free children from disadvantaged backgrounds and to help them and stuff like that. The reality is it does exactly the opposite. Um, the progressive view actually means that um, children from, uh, from disadvantaged backgrounds actually fall behind. And there's a really simple reason for that. It's because children from advantaged backgrounds, they go to uh, museums, their parents read to them at night. Okay, they get this really solid grounding in, in education, in, in, in like all those basics. And then when they come to school and their teacher says, go away and you know, research this on the internet and look at that, they've got that foundation there, which they can then build on. Um, but children from disadvantaged backgrounds, as we know, don't get you know, read to at night. They don't get parents that sit and read with them. And um, so they tend to fall further and further behind. Now, I'm not saying that because I'm you know, trying to argue one point or the other. I'm making this point really quite simply. It's because education does not escape the culture wars. Education does not escape the culture wars. Um, Neil didn't mention it, but um, my wife Catherine is a, is a Presbyterian minister, a minister in Malone. Um, and I do remember, this, this is a brilliant story, um, when she was being interviewed to be the minister in Malone, um, she, if you met my wife, you would understand this, I think Neil probably does, she wanted to be sure that the Kirk session uh, knew what they were getting, that they knew what they were getting. So she came up with this line that she was going to finish off after they have asked her all these questions, and it went a little bit like this, I can't do it justice, she normally gets her finger out and starts pointing and stuff like that. But she said, um, I'm an evangelical, ecumenical, charismatic female minister and they're non-negotiable. To which point, somebody on the Kirk session pipes up and says, um, well, I would hope being female is non-negotiable. <laughs> <laughs> but but this, is the intro this is the interesting point. Who would have thought that 10 years later, that, that sentence is controversial or debatable? That whether somebody is male or female is, is, is controversial or debatable? I don't want to get into the debate around that. I'm not going to tell you which side I fall on, but that that is the world in which our children are growing up. Certainties about whether somebody's a male or a female that we took for granted. Okay, that's being questioned. That's being questioned on social media that our children look at. It's in the news all the time. Okay? Um, education does not escape the culture wars. And this is why building those city walls of prayer is so important. Okay? It's so, so important. Um, because our children need to know who they are in Christ. They need to know who they are in Christ. Um, and so it's so important that um, at home, okay, that we're reinforcing that message. Um, in schools as well, um, again, you mentioned about um, children wanting to be removed from RE lessons and stuff like that. It's an incredibly delicate balance. Um, I know Mr. Hutchinson, the principal at, at Glastry, says the college has an unashamedly Christian um, culture. And he says that in front of everybody to the parents. And those, those values, okay, they, they permeate what the school does from the pastoral care structure, from the lessons in RE and so on and so forth because it's important that children can come to school um, and feel safe, feel, va feel valued and feel part of the school family. So that big picture stuff is really, really important but um, since being a VP, the thing I've missed more than anything else is being in the classroom. I love the daily interactions with students and I don't get that as much as I did um, obviously as a, as, as a VP when I was working in, in, you know, in classrooms all the time. Um, and increasingly what we find is education is no longer just about imparting knowledge, okay, there's, there's, there's values and sport and all that kind of stuff. But teachers are increasingly like social workers and counsellors, um, and so building those, those, those city walls are really, really important, okay, to sort of support those teachers as they interact with those students. And it's those interactions that are really, really important and are really valued, and I really value. And I read um, that the average teacher makes over 1,500 decisions related to students each day. Not about whether or not um, they're going to you know, go to the, to the science staff room or the technology staff room, but specifically decisions about um, students learning. Are they going to um, offer them another level of support? Are they going to withdraw that support to make the student um, struggle and try and learn that? Um, but it works out about a decision every 10 to 15 seconds about whether or not they should sanction that child, whether or not they should ignore that behaviour, whether or not they should challenge that behaviour. And um, basically, another bit of research said that um, for every negative comment that an adult or a teacher makes to a child, it takes seven positive comments to get that student's sense of self-worth back to where it was. So teachers' words, teachers' actions have a real significant influence. 
And what I do as a, as, a, as a Christian teacher in that context is I try and bring God into those interactions and into those decisions. I'm not saying I'm always going to make the right you know, um, choice or, or say the right thing. I'm not perfect. But Jesus was, or Jesus is. And so by praying and asking him to sort of be with me in each day and each decision, and I suppose by shaping my own character through prayer, through by, uh, reading the Bible, I would hope that I would get those conversations, make those uh, right decisions more often than not. And I guess... It's the same for you guys in, in, in whatever context you're in. It's just becoming more like Jesus, okay? Shaping your character to be more like his so that you make the right decisions, that you say the right things um, in your home lives, in your work lives, in all of those things, which is what I would say is, is most important. Um, the last thing then is, I guess I was reading, I don't know if you guys have heard of, of Rick Hill. Rick is, uh, uh, Catherine gave me the title, the Secretary for the Counseling Mission in Ireland. And he, re he released a book, and there's this brilliant bit in this book, in, uh, in one of the chapters, he talked about Jewish culture 2,000 years ago, where young boys aged around 11 to 13 were put through their paces learning the Torah, um, uh, and those that were deemed to have passed uh, went on to study under a rabbi um, or work in a synagogue or something like that, and those that were deemed to be not good enough or deemed by the society at the time to have failed returned to their family trades and their businesses. Um, and what I always found fascinating when I read that is that Jesus took those people, took those young boys um, who uh, were fishermen amongst others, and with them that society deemed to not necessarily failed, uh, sorry, not necessarily to have, have achieved anything in life or to be not good enough, he took them and changed the world. Um, and with Jesus, anything is possible. And regardless, I suppose, of what I or anyone else believes about selective education in Northern Ireland, there are a group of children that arrive in schools in Northern Ireland perceiving that they have some, to some degree failed and um, again whether you like that or not, you, you, you agree with selective education or not that's the reality um, my passion personally and I'm speaking just personally here because I think it's important to say that about what I believe is to kind of harness and guide the potential in all students um, so Jesus saw the potential in those in those men um, in those disciples and it's my passion really to help students realize who they're meant to be um, before I was a VP, I was a head of geography, I was also a head of year. And when I was a head of year, I used to have this um, play on the word application. Um, and it's got like two meanings. Um, the obvious one about applying yourself, working hard, um, but also the modern definition, which is of an app that you get on your phone. Um, and then I'll just read it here. An app is something that's designed for a specific purpose. Something that's designed for a specific purpose. And that's us. God's designed us. God's designed each student, okay, for a specific purpose. And helping students discover what that is and supporting them to get there is a great privilege. Uh, privilege. And it's my privilege to, to help students sort of realize that they have unique skills and talents in the context that I work in. Um, that they realize that they have purpose and they can be a positive um, influence in their own lives, okay, the lives of their families and their communities. Um, and I guess that's my most significant prayer, uh, prayer request, I guess, for you guys, and like I said about praying for the local schools, is that you help those students know their purpose um, because God has created them with that purpose. But sometimes when they're not necessarily in, in, a, in, a, in a context that they can understand and learn that, then um, we can pray and we can help them um, to know that. So thanks very much for listening, gents. Cheers. Thank you, man. Um, God was definitely in that, because I didn't want to tell them too much of what they say. I just wanted to let them say what the Lord laid in their heart, and they're certainly, I will take a lot away from, from tonight. We're not taking any tea away, but you can have one now, but you can't take it home with you. It's not a takeaway mug. Um, Richard will serve you at the back there. Oh, well, he's not so sure about that, but <laughs> Richard has laid the tea out. Thank you very much, Richard, for that. Man, go and grab a cup of tea, and I think, I know we've got four or five sort of preset groups, but that might be like herding cats, but could you organize yourselves into sort of three groups? Count the num num somebody count the number that's about here, and we'll have a group up here, and, and a group back there, and maybe a group up here, and have a bit of a chat for half an hour, and then we'll, we'll gather up again, and if there's any questions, uh, that, that you guys can just slip into the groups and maybe move around a wee bit, but if there's any burning questions, we can ask them uh, at the end, and then we'll close with our, uh, it's really our theme tune now, isn't it, really? It is. We've really got a theme tune to finish off uh, every one of these men's gatherings, so uh, we'll sing that. But please go and grab a wee cup of tea, and then we'll give you all a wee shout in about half an hour's time.
Lord, we are all educators in one sense. We educate one another, we love one another up. But for these uh, men in front of us who work in that very difficult environment, we pray your blessing on them. And Lord, we just ask your blessing on us as now we seek you to pray uh, for these men. In Jesus' name. Amen. So, men, just make your way up there. It's been led us all to come up and pray with these men. And then we'll begin our time to you. Phil and Johnny for coming this evening. I don't know about the other groups, but our group really enjoyed discussing what you were talking about. I find it really beneficial. I have two children in education, so thank you, gentlemen. We really appreciate you coming. Give them a round of applause, guys. <laughs> but we're going to close now with our last hymn and it's called stand up stand up for jesus so let's stand and praise god together
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this precious time we've spent together, diving into your word and seeking your guidance. And Lord, your presence has been among us, and we are truly thankful for your grace and love. And Lord, we lift up our hearts to you and ask for your continued guidance and strength as we leave this place. We pray that you would empower each and every one of us to be encouragers in the lives of our fellow men. And may we be instruments of your love, shining your light into the lives of those we encounter each day. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all today and forevermore. Amen.